The World Leather and Leather Biz team are delighted to be collaborating with APLF by providing content for their Academy Week. Back in 2014, the team established the Nothing to Hide website, a collection of hard-hitting essays to dispel the myths about the leather industry that circulate due to a mixture of lazy journalism as well as journalists and pressure groups who have an anti-meat and therefore anti-leather agenda. This website tells the truth about the leather industry and is an open source resource for anyone who wishes to use the information published. In 2021, it's time to update those essays when we have started with the first two regarding hides and skins and animal welfare. In this presentation, Dr. Kerry Senior, Secretary of the International Council of Tanners, and Steve Sothman, President of the Leather and High Council of America, present the environmental impact of not tanning hides and having to bury them in landfill as well as the often misleading claims of alternative materials. Ian Sher from Prime Asia will explain why animal welfare is so important and Prime Asia's commitment to their responsibly, responsibly raised programme. To round up this session, Kerry, Steve and Ian will take part in a panel discussion moderated by World Leather's editor, Stephen Tinney. I hope you enjoy the next hour or so. I am Kerry Senior, Director of Leather UK, the Trade Association for the UK Leather Industry, and also Secretary for the International Council of Tanners. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about leather and the issue with alternatives. Um, what we're going to do is look at some of the considerations around the materials offered as alternatives to leather. Uh, I will start by saying that the leather industry actually welcomes innovation in materials and is not afraid of the current or emerging alternatives. Leather cannot fill all the potential demand for products uh, and for some customers. Uh, their personal ethics mean that they would not use leather. However, the promotion of these materials often includes a tax on leather and this cannot go unchallenged. Uh, off, I'm just briefly going to recover what is leather, um, which is something that I'm sure this audience is very familiar with. And what is shown here is the definition from the British Standard Glossary of Terms, BS 2780. Uh, this is almost entirely replicated in the SEN standard and also the ISO standard. And what it essentially says is that leather is the hide or skin of an animal with the fibre structure intact, which has been tanned to be impetressible. Uh, and this is what we all understand leather to be. Uh, it's a product from the meat industry, which is then upcycled into a valuable and beautiful product. Uh, and just for peace of mind, the uh, giraffe skin on the right there is from an animal that died of old age in Safari Park, which just demonstrates that any animal can be converted into leather. Maybe we have to ask the question, what is not leather? And this is where we start to see the alternatives uh, to leather that are frequently used. Uh, the first one to discuss is one that has been around for a long time and we're all very familiar with, and this would be reconstituted leather fibre, uh, also known as leather fibre board. So this is where um, waste from the manufacture of leather, uh, waste cuttings, trimmings, etc., are broken down into uh, fibre and then reconstituted, usually in a plastic matrix to make a material that can be made to look like leather. Um, it also includes materials like e-leather, um, which is currently emerging um, uh, as fly leather for some Nike trainers. Uh, this is slightly different in the case that the, the fibres are not reconstituted with um, synthetics but are uh, introduced into a matrix using um, the power of water. And again, produces a material that looks like leather. More recent developments uh, include things like the plant derived materials. And these are things like um, Pinyatex, which is made from the residues from pineapples or the so-called mushroom or apple leathers. Um, the mushroom leathers in particular, the mycelial leathers are very interesting. These are made from uh, mycelial fibres, uh, which are then processed. Um, and these are interesting emerging technologies. Uh, and obviously anything that valorises waste from another industry, 
has got to be worth consideration. Um, the new kids on the block, uh, very interesting and very early, are the so-called lab-grown collagens. This is where the, um, the DNA is taken from cattle, uh, introduced into yeast to grow the animal collagen directly, obviously collagen being the base of leather. Uh, and this would include uh, Modern Meadows product, Zoa. I think this is a material that is very much at the early stages of development. Um, as you can see, that white T-shirt there is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and that is a T-shirt that has been detailed with some of this material. I think that's probably about as far as it's got. However, these are all interesting and emerging technologies. Um, and of course, <clears throat> the one we all know and loathe, plastic. Uh, things like vegan leather, pleather, synthetic leather, leatherette. These are materials that are made to look like leather, but are entirely synthetic, made from PU, PVC, etc. So one of the problems with these materials uh, is the description of them and their appropriation of the image of leather and the understanding in the consumer's mind of the properties of leather. Um, it should be noted that some of these materials, some of the manufacturers of these materials do not describe their product as leather, uh, but they are frequently referred to as an alternative as leather in the press. And all are frequently compared to leather uh, with claims made about the relative uh, environmental impacts compared to these alternatives. And when we talk about these impacts, there are, there are a number of common themes. Typically, we hear about animal welfare, deforestation, climate change, and chemicals. Um, and here there are two quotes from two recent publications uh, discussing um, alternative to to, alternatives to leather, in this case, both the mushroom leathers. Whereas we can see in the first quote, um, the claim is that animal agriculture is a significant source of global emissions and tropical deforestation, and alternatives are undoubtedly a lower carbon, a more humane alternative to animal leather and the traditional tanning process, which often uses toxic chemicals. That from Vogue magazine this year. And then the use of heavy metals in tanning and the dyeing process has been a major concern in leather manufacture, putting at risk the environment through chemicals leaking into the water, uh, the workers and also the wearers themselves. And the leather industry has been responsible for deforestation in South America. That from an article in Harper's Bazaar last year. So these materials are always juxtaposed negatively against leather. Uh, the claims against leather are always negative. This also comes through in the claims made by manufacturers um, on the website of Deserto, the manufacturers of the so-called cactus leather, is the claim that the tremendous of the tremendous harm that the tanning industry causes worldwide and how even in fully modernized tanneries it is nearly impossible to reclaim all the pollutants generated. Similarly on the website of Bolt Threads, who are the manufacturers of mycelial product Milo, they claim that it is less harmful to the planet and a sustainable alternative to leather, noting that unlike leather production, Milo does not involve raising livestock. Uh, it's also interesting on the Milo website that they, uh, they know that it's too early to have an independent study on the materials environmental footprint, which rather begs the question of how they can make such a sustainability claim. OK, so the question then is, what are these materials? These are the uh, compositions of four of the most popular ones in the press, ones we hear about a lot. Uh, I'm using Milo here as an example of the mycelium fibres, but there is also reishi, uh, which is another product. And again, these are um, mycelial fibres grown from essentially fungi, um, which are then processed into sheets. And these sheets are then tanned and finished in tanneries, which is an important point to note. Another popular um, alternative is apple leather, uh, and this is where Apple peel and core are taken, pureed, and then blended with 50% and indeed up to 70% polyurethane to make a leather alternative. Pinutex is a very well known alternative, um, and this uses uh, pineapple leaves, about 80% in the product, with a 20% polylactic acid bioplastic uh, and a petroleum based resin or finish. Um, the poly polylactic um, Bioplastic is um, used because it is, under certain circumstances, biodegradable, but we'll come back to that later. 
And then finally, uh, one that has come out quite recently and with a, a lot of um, fanfare about how many animals it's going to save is the Zerto, uh, the leather made from cactus, uh, which uses cactus pulp bonded with 65% polyurethane. Um, so the question is, of course, if these products are processed in tanneries and if they're largely made of plastic, are they really a sustainable alternative to leather? Well, as will be discussed later in this series but in Steve Sothman's presentation, leather does not drive cattle production. Cattle are not reared for their hides. Substituting leather will not see fewer animals reared or slaughtered and so will not impact on climate change or deforestation. In fact, landfilling hides and substituting leather for plastics, by far the most common alternative, will almost certainly increase greenhouse gas emissions. Furthermore, that given that hide production is inevitable, can we really afford to waste valuable raw materials like hides? The claims around chemistry and environment are also highly questionable. These materials are, for the large part, made of plastic. And while they may, there may be a benefit in reducing plastic use and valorizing plant wastes, when disposed of, these products will simply add to the burden of plastic waste in the environment. Even the bioplastic used in pineapple uh, leather will be an issue as this will only biodegrade if treated in an industrial composting facility. Given the issues around the recovery and sorting of materials uh, from the fashion industry, this seems highly unlikely. And it has to be noted that the mycelial products are tanned and finished in tanneries. And we can only assume that this means using very similar, if not identical, chemical processes. So it seems clear that the claims around animal welfare and climate change do not stand up to scrutiny. Uh, substituting leather will not change the impact of livestock and the claims around more sustainable processing are certainly open to question. This is particularly pertinent when the use phase and end phase of life uh, of the product are considered where plastics are known to be more persistent and damaging than leather. Okay so clearly there is no use for a material that has excellent environmental credentials but is not fit for use in intended in intended products. So the question then is are these a functional alternative to leather? And this is something that is very rarely questioned by those promoting these materials. Well, recently, uh, it was published this year, the German Research Institute Filk analyzed the functional performance of 10 alternatives to leather, including a PU coated uh, textile, deserto, the cactus leather, apple leather, pineapple leather, and a mushroom leather. Uh, the physical performance of the materials was tested using a number of standard test methods and against a benchmark of leather for footwear wrappers, as this is the most common end use for leather. None of the materials could match leather uh, in all the test cat categories considered, and importantly, none of the alternatives could match leather in five key functional areas, these being tensile strength and tear strength, flex resistance, water vapor permeability, and water vapor absorption. These five functions are critical to the comfort and durability of leather in use in footwear. So why does this matter? Well, it has very simple, significant implications for the use phase of the product. These are not assessed by the study, but the data supports the conclusion that the alternatives are not functional replacements for leather. It suggests that not only will leather products last longer due to their greater resistance to wear, but in the case of footwear, consumers would probably want to keep them longer due to their implied greater comfort. This could be speculation, obviously, but in the course of researching for this uh, presentation, I came across the following comments in the section on an article in the Vegan Life magazine entitled Debate Should Vegans Wear Secondhand Leather? And I think they're quite revealing. So, for instance, I recently bought three pairs of awesome, unique secondhand leather shoes, which I love and cherish. The vegan shoes were $10 a pair and the secondhand shoes were $1 per pair. They will last a long time, too. I am tired of cheap vegan shoes. When it comes to shoes, I just wear my old leather pre-vegan shoes. And I brought two more pairs secondhand for work. I know they will last forever and buying cheap, cheap faux leather shoes just to throw them away a few months later isn't environmentally friendly. And then finally, in the past six years, I have bought two faux leather jackets. Both of them deteriorated within a couple of years. A proper leather jacket or any real leather item such as a belt or shoes are enduring. If I bought a real leather jacket in 2014 instead of a faux one, I'd still have the original leather jacket 
instead of having got through two. This is by no means the only opinion that was expressed on secondhand leather on this particular debate, but for even those with concerns around the use of animal products, it's clear that the alternatives fall some way short of leather in use. And clearly the most ethical choice for a consumer looking to reduce their environmental impact is to buy less, buy better and keep longer. And clearly leather fits perfectly into that concept. So what should we do about alternatives to leather? Well, firstly, we need to know that we should not fear them. These alternatives are not going to go away and there is more than enough space in the market for them. And I reiterate the point that the industry is not opposed to new uh, materials or innovation, and there will always be a need for materials for those people whose personal ethics would not allow them to use leather. Importantly, we need to de continue the fight for better protection for the term leather to ensure that these alternatives are clearly separated from leather products. Various surveys have shown that consumers are confused by some of the oxymorons used around these alternatives, and misleading descriptions of non-leather products are commonplace. And importantly, in order to convince our customers that leather is a good choice, we need to evidence the sustainability of our leather. Brands and consumers are increasingly looking for reassurance that the products they buy are acceptable. Often this takes the form of sustainability labels issued by third parties. It is clear that the image of leather is being damaged by sustainability metrics that rely on out of date or inaccurate data, and this must be corrected. And the only people that can do this are the leather industry. Thank you. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for, for the invitation here uh, to, to participate today. I, I really appreciate it. And, and especially with, with some of the other participants uh, on this webinar, uh, highly esteemed colleagues and, and really appreciate being able to uh, speak alongside them, if, if not in person, but at least virtually. Uh, just a, a, a real quick in, uh, introduction to me and my organization. For those who don't know who we are, what we do, I, I'm the president. I'm Steve Sothman. I'm the president of the Leather and Hide Council of America. So we are a uh, full service industry trade association representing uh, the entire supply chain for, for the leather industry in the U.S. and in North America. So our members start from the meatpacking plant, go through hide processing, leather tanning, down to the leather goods. Uh, we also have the chemical companies that supply the material uh, for that industry as well, as well as another, a number of other service providers. Uh, we are a relatively new association in name, uh, formed in, in, in 2020 after the merger of a couple uh, existing industry organizations, but our roots go all the way back to 1919. So we've, we've been doing this uh, uh, for a while here. Um, so we are, we are the major voice uh, for this industry uh, here in North America, and we try to be involved in this uh, globally, obviously, as well. So I, uh, I, I'm i going to give a pretty brief uh, uh, discussion today, and, and I, I have a pretty pretty simple message. Uh, and obviously, I'll, I'll, I'll dig into it a little bit, but my, my message is leather is a byproduct of food production. That That is a fact. And uh, we'll talk about that and, and, and why we therefore have an ethical duty to use the hides that are produced, the skins that are produced, and, and the leather that is resulting from that byproduct nature. So um, I, I'll dig into that, but it's a very, very simple message that we, we need to be utilizing what is available to us uh, as a society. Uh, so, of course, we have to start with uh, the live animal and why we have hides or leather to begin with. Well, it's because uh, we as humans uh, uh, need animal proteins, um, especially beef. This is a uh, this is a, a, a highly nutritious, uh, dense food that is utilized all over the world um, for our consumption and, and obviously for uh, uh, to live. And so why do we why do we produce beef? You know, why 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 that animal protein as opposed to any other proteins like a plant based protein or something like that? Well, it's because, uh, first of all, cattle as ruminants are the original upcyclers um, cattle obviously are able to digest plant matter that we as humans cannot digest, uh, convert that into a protein uh, that we can then uh, obviously utilize. Uh, there's a lot of uh, statistics that get thrown around that you might have heard of uh, saying things like, well, two thirds of the farmland in the entire world is utilized for, for cattle production, and that's far too much. And, you know, and some, some go as high as 75%. Well, uh, 
those statistics are a little bit misleading because they're not telling you what type of land is being uh, used to raise these cattle. Uh, a lot of times the land is what we would call marginal land. Uh, marginal land is, 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 as it sounds, it's land that is not, uh, uh, not able to be cultivated for traditional crop production. So uh, think of grasslands, obviously, is a, a major example of that. Uh, there's large grasslands in, uh, in most, most continents around the world. Uh, and then also lands within cultivating spaces that might not be accessible to a farmer. So very steep inclines, um, you know, for one reason or another, just, just you can't get a plow in there and, and grow other crops. And on top of that, uh, ruminants do a really good job of cleaning up after we've harvested our other, our other uh, plant products. So uh, there's a lot of plant material that is left in the field after you make a harvest, you know, you do a harvest. Uh, that then you can send in ruminant animals to go clean up what has been left out there on the on the, uh, on the field. And then, again, they turn that into a, a protein that's, that's uh, highly beneficial to our consumption. Uh, ruminants have been doing this for thousands, if not millions of years. I, I, I don't think that's a, that's a new information for anybody. But uh, uh, in, in the North America, just as an example, there are estimates that we had over 60 million head of bison. Uh, roaming buffalo or bison roaming the, the Great Plains of, of the U.S. and Canada, uh, doing this exact same process for thousands and millions of years. So uh, this is part of our, our normal, our, our normal uh, way of life uh, as humans. Now, in the U.S. specifically, typically we, we do finish a lot of our beef specifically raised animals in a feedlot system. Uh, where they are finished on, on grains. Uh, so they spend the vast majority of their life in, in grass and pasture, um, you know, in that traditional kind of sense. Then they are moved into a feedlot system uh, to, to consume both uh, grass and, and forage, but then also supplemented with grains. But 90% of what they're eating is, is, uh, is grass. Now, the reason we do that is because of efficiency. Uh, that process provides uh, quite a highly efficient uh, conversion from grain to grass or from grain to protein, um, and makes the U.S. cattle and beef industry one of the most efficient in terms of output in the entire world. So fun statistic I've uh, seen recently is uh, the U.S. Uh, beef industry uh, produced 22% more beef in 2020 than Brazil did with 60% less of the animals. So something to really keep in mind as we discuss sustainability and, and those types of issues. Uh, I, I will be remiss if, to talk about cattle production if I, don't, uh, if I don't mention greenhouse gases. Obviously, everybody hears about that in the popular media. Uh, this is a sorely misunderstood area in the popular media and one that has been warped uh, to, to fit certain narratives. And one that I think you're going to, as, as general consumers and media, will start to see is changing in terms of our understanding of this going forward. So uh, just a few numbers for you. Um, Globally, cattle uh, produce an estimated 14% of our greenhouse gas emissions. It used, there was a number that was put out there that was 18% that from the FAO. This goes back a number of years. Uh, that number was revised to 14%, so make sure whenever you see the 18% number, you know that's been revised down. Uh, but that's encompassing the entire globe and extremely different styles and, and types of uh, animal husbandry systems. So if you look at the U.S. and other very uh, advanced beef production systems around the world, uh, th those greenhouse gas emissions are quite a bit lower uh, than they are for the global average. So in the U.S., our uh, direct emissions from cattle are 2% of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If you look at a life cycle assessment version of it, so all the feed inputs, all the transportation, everything involved into it, it's about 3.9% of our entire U.S. Ex uh, uh, emissions for greenhouse gases. So quite a bit smaller than the popular media has probably been telling you. Um, and, and, we, and I think that narrative is, is about to change uh, in, in a lot of ways. Another really important point on, on greenhouse gases is uh, the source of the carbon being emitted really matters. Uh, if you're only looking at emissions, you're not getting the full picture. And uh, this is something that's been sorely missing in this discussion for many decades now. And that is because cattle are not releasing new carbon into the atmosphere, okay? The, 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 per, the drivers of climate change is, is, of course, carbon in the atmosphere, but it's new carbon that has been released from the ground, from various sources in the form of uh, fossil fuels into our atmosphere. So what cattle are, are, are emitting is carbon that has been sequestered from the air into plant material. They eat that plant material, convert it to methane, methane's uh, released into the air. As many of you know, methane is a uh, very 
uh, highly impactful gas in terms of our, our in terms of climate change. It has a higher heating uh, rate than carbon does, uh, but it also only has a lifespan of 10 years. So methane is it will will be emitted uh, by these cattle as part of their digestion process, but that methane will also break down over 10 years um, and does not stay long term in our atmosphere the same way that carbon emissions, CO2 emissions do. They accumulate in our atmosphere and stay there for thousands of years. So I'll leave it there. That is a, an entire presentation unto itself, but just a couple notes that go along with that. I mentioned the, the uh, how efficient the beef production system is, how much that matters in the U.S. and other other large beef producing countries, uh, and that's because we need we need those nutrients. Uh, we are we have a growing population. We are going to have 10 billion people on this planet by 2050. We need to be able to feed those people, and animal proteins is one of the major ways we're doing this, especially in some of the poorest areas of the world. Uh, they do not have a choice of being. Uh, an entirely plant-based uh, uh, population in terms of what they consume. So uh, uh, I'll back that up with just a quick mention of a study that was done here in the U.S. It was by the Department of Agriculture, our, our governmental agency. They, they looked at uh, what would happen in terms of kind of a, 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 a thought piece. They looked at what would happen if our entire agricultural system removed animal proteins, animal agriculture from that system. What would be the, what would be the result? Well, they found that our, our emissions would decrease by 2.6%. So not that full uh, 9% that, that are, uh, I should say, 4% from, from cattle production. Uh, I think all of animal agriculture is 5% of our, our emissions. So we would, we would reduce that by 2.6%. Not all the way down to zero, though, because obviously then you have other inputs that need to make up for the lost manure some of the other uh, fertilizers that you do get out of animal agriculture, now you have to supplement that with uh, uh, synthetic oil-based uh, products. Uh, the big part, uh, the, the, one of the big uh, conclusions of this study though was uh, we would not be producing enough nutrients to feed the US population if we removed all of animal agriculture. So when you look at food production, when you look at sustainability on the food side, you don't just look at how much food is being produced. You also have to look at the nutrient content of that food. Uh, so in this scenario, we would no longer be uh, producing enough nutrients to feed the United States, much less any other country. As many of you know, the, the US is a, is a large exporter of, of food products to, to other countries in the world. Uh, that would be completely removed um, uh, from the scenario, and we would have a hunger issue. We would have a malnutrition and a hunger problem, not only in the U.S., but uh, in other regions of the world. So these are all interconnected and just uh, goes to reinforce how important uh, animal proteins are to our diet globally. Uh, final point on the live animal side and, and, and on beef production itself. Um, one of the ways we are going to reduce emissions in cattle and beef industry, even though it is part of a biogenic cycle, even though it is, it is part of a natural cycle, obviously we all are aware that we need to be reducing our emissions from any source we possibly can. So uh, one of the ways that this industry is going to do that is to get more efficient, to pr produce more protein with less animals. Um, then you have on a, on a overall aggregate basis, less impact on the environment. So luckily within the U.S. and in many other uh, developed countries, we, we are doing that. Um, for example, uh, in, in, in the U.S. in 1977, we had 122 million head of cattle in our country. As of 2020, we had 94 million head of cattle. So 33% reduction. We produced the exact same amount of beef we did in 1977. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a more efficient system. Uh, they do that with uh, very evidence science-based uh, decision-making to improve the herd. So it's uh, making sure that the, when we do produce an animal, that animal doesn't get sick and die out in the field. So it's better uh, animal health. It's better welfare. We want to treat these animals correctly, make sure that they are healthy. Uh, better animal nutrition, ensuring that they get what they need to grow and be happy, health, you know, happy and healthy cows. And then we do focus quite a bit on genetics as well, uh, ensuring that we are we are producing animals that are most uh, suitable to the climates that they are in and, and able to produce uh, uh, what we need from the vegetation that's available in that, in that climate. So uh, that was a lot of information about why we produce beef, but now let's turn to the leather side of it, okay? So we have to produce beef, we have to produce animal proteins in order to feed, feed the world. Now, leather is a byproduct of that process. 
So we need to be utilizing the resources that are available to us. This is how we act sustainably. This is how we ensure that we are using the resources that are, are, are there. And leather is inevitably a byproduct of this, this system and therefore one we, we want to be capturing and utilizing. So there's a lot of groups that try to say and try to make arguments uh, that leather is actually, you know, a co-product. It, it, it drives a lot of uh, decision making in, in the cattle industry. And all of that, frankly, is bollocks. Uh, if you look at the, the pure data, uh, the pure economic data, it's a very clear picture that, that, the, that the hide is not driving an animal, an animal production decision. If there's a rancher in this world or a farmer in this world that is raising animals, especially cattle, for leather production purposes, they are not going to be a farmer or a rancher for very long because it is, they are going to be losing money left and right. So I, pull, uh, I, I pulled this report just so everyone's aware of it. This is from our U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, they release it every single day. Uh, it's called the U.S. Byproduct Drop Value uh, Report. Uh, and it basically shows you what all the, all the byproducts are worth when they come off of an animal for that day. So uh, in, in middle of May last year, obviously, we were dealing with a lot of COVID-19 shutdowns and, and disruptions. Uh, our, our values for hides uh, got to historic lows. And so we saw a cattle hide was worth only about 1.25% the value of the entire animal. So 1% of the value of the animal, not what's driving the value uh, for the production of the animal. His, <laughs> historically, excuse me, historically, that number hovers between 3% and 5% the value of the animal. Uh, but obviously, if we have low leather demand, which we did last year and which we've had for a couple of years, those, those highs are still being produced. Uh, they, they are not going away. Uh, so that's exactly the point I'm, I'm going to make here. Uh, we are in the situation, unfortunately, where we are dumping these hides. Uh, when we do not have enough leather demand uh, for these hides, these hides still get produced. We still produce the food, but these hides just end up in a landfill. Uh, so in 2019, it's a perfect example. 2019 was a really rough year for the leather industry, especially in the U.S. Uh, we still processed 33 million head of cattle that year. Uh, based on the available data that we have in terms of our exports, pro uh, domestic production, that type of stuff, uh, we were able to, to estimate that about 27.5 million U.S. hides uh, made it into the leather supply chain, that, which means 5.5 million did not. Uh, so where were those hides? Uh, some of them might have ended up in a, in a warehouse stored until a better market, but not the vast majority of them. The vast majority of them, we believe, ended up in a landfill when especially smaller meat packers, local butchers, those types of people could not find a, a market for those hides. So they just unfortunately sent them to the landfill. Um, so we did a little bit of a, a, a further thought experiment with this, where we said, okay, uh, what is the carbon that has been released as a result of those hides ending up in a landfill? Obviously, when you have uh, uh, materials of, of a bio, you know, biological nature, you know, carbon-based nature, that they are going to release that carbon as they decompose in a landfill. So what would that be? So we took the, the, the conversion factors that are... Uh, readily available from, from uh, we, we use the Environmental Protection Agency's uh, data just to, to say, okay, what would be the, the decomposition factor? So um, 27 and a half million hides in 2019 from the U.S. were converted to leather. So CO2 equivalent around 627,000 <coughs> tons of CO2, excuse me, five and a half million that ended up in the landfill, 120,000 CO2 ton equivalent, uh, tons of CO2 equivalents ended up in the landfill. And, uh, and were released instead of remaining sequestered in that leather. Obviously, that's a, uh, something we don't want to see. Nobody wants to see that. We want to continue to, to drive those numbers uh, down as best we can. Now, if we take that and we extend it globally, the impact is even more magnified. Uh, cattle hide numbers, cattle slaughter numbers globally are, are very difficult to estimate. There are, there's a wide range of estimations. Um, it, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture estimates we, we slaughter about 240 to 250 million head of cattle globally each year. The FAO estimates it's, it's upwards of 340 million head of cattle a year. And, and last year, they, they estimated 337 million. So what we did is we said, okay, we'll take that same, that same calculus that we did for the U.S., and apply it globally to the, we'll use the, the worst case scenario FAO numbers um, and, and, and determine what, how many highs are ended up in the landfill. Uh, so we know about 187 million of those highs were traded or, or produced into leather in one way or another, just based on our statistics that we do have. So that means estimates are 150 million of those, those highs did not make it into the leather supply chain in one way or another, uh, which would equal 3.3 million tons of CO2 equivalent ending up in a, in a landfill globally that could have been converted to leather and store that carbon in that hide. Uh, obviously, these are estimated numbers, but 
regardless of which number you end up using, it's a large amount and something that we really need to be as an industry focusing on keeping it sequestered in those hides, not letting it go into the landfill. So I will stop there. Um, I think one of my colleagues is going to talk about this a little bit further, but one of the major drivers behind uh, the lack of leather demand has been the rise of plastic synthetics um, and even some of the plant-based synthetics that are still contain quite a lot of plastics in them um, are, are taking away the leather's market share in these areas. So it's something that we really, as a society, need to be focusing on and saying, is this really the best use of our resources? So I'll leave it to my colleagues to talk about that further, uh, but we are uh, we have an ethical duty to be using these materials and we are not doing it to our fullest extent at the moment. So I will stop there take questions later and thank you very much. So good morning, good evening. My name is Ian Scher and I'm Vice President of Procurement for the Prime Asia Leather Company. Uh, here today to talk about animal welfare. So what is behind the increased emphasis on animal welfare today? Through the immense networks of social and other media platforms today, consumers are far more informed than ever before. And as such, are far more demanding in terms of their comprehensive knowledge of all aspects around the products that they purchase. Today, they focus on sustainability at the core of their beliefs. And with that comes traceability, animal welfare, environmental responsibility, and social responsibility. A recent uh, survey of the global brand members of the Leather Working Group revealed that 80 4% set improved traceability of the leather supply chain as their key target. When asked, 71% of those responded that it was concerns over animal welfare that were the main driver for their wanting improved traceability of their raw material. And this was ahead of concerns regarding deforestation or other social concerns. So it's important to define animal welfare in broad-based terms. And the best reference we can give is the five animal freedoms. And these are considered the gold standard in animal welfare. Freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury and disease, freedom to express their normal and natural behavior, and freedom from fear and distress. Of 93 major industrial and agricultural countries around the world, only 12 do not have specific laws relating to animal rights, cruelty and welfare. Most developed and a majority of developing countries have numerous not-for-profit groups involved in monitoring animal welfare today. In the USA, there are over 60 organizations focused on animal welfare in one way or another. The UK has 33 such organizations with the most famous being the RSPCA. And many other countries have various organizations <laughs> with many in some countries directly or indirectly related to the RSPCA. Various, here in the United States, there have been various state laws around the treatment of animals in the USA that date back to 1828. The American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was formed in 1866, in line with the already existing Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in the UK. By 1907, Every state in the USA had laws enacted relating to animal welfare. And in 1910, that started to include the inspection of slaughterhouses here in the USA. In 1958, the Humane Slaughter Act was the first federal legislation passed regarding the humane slaughter of animals. And along the way, 
as a result of the growth of organizations such as PETA and the Animal Liberation Front, numerous other legislations have come into effect regarding the treatment of animals in general. But the most significant change came in 1978 with the passing of the Humane Methods of Slaughtering Act, defining acceptable practices for meatpacking plants and appointing the USDA as the enforcement body. Today, the FSIS, which is the Food Safety and Inspection Service, monitors those standards that are set by legislation for every meat packing house in the USA. The North American Meat Institute's origins go back to 1906. Today, 95% of all USA beef, veal and pork products in the USA are provided by supplier members of the North American Meat Institute. Dr. Temple Grandin is an American scientist and activist. She has been a propo prominent proponent for the humane behavior and treatment of livestock for slaughter, and is the author of more than 60 scientific papers on animal behavior. Her guidelines have led to major improvements in the safety, plant efficiencies, and morale alongside ensuring the most humane standards for the treatment of livestock. These guidelines have an added bonus for meat plants around the world in terms of the overall improvement in the yields that packing plants see in terms of their quality. There are various bodies monitoring animal welfare here in the USA. The North American Meat Institutes set standards for the transportation and safe handling of animals from the birth farm to the background to the feed yard and the eventual slaughterhouse. Beef Quality Assurance is a program that trains farmers and ranchers on the best practices of cattle management techniques to ensure that their animals and the environment are cared for within a standard set of guidelines and regulations across the US beef industry. Today, around 85% of product in the USA is under BQA programs. Where Food Comes From is an independent third-party verification group designed to provide authentic and accredited third-party verification and certification of specific programs that meat packers wish to, wish to run. Certified Humane is dedicated to improving the lives of farm animals in food production from birth through slaughter. The goal of their program is to improve the lives of farm animals by expanding consumer awareness, driving the demand for kinder and more responsible farm animal practices. The NCBA or the National Cattlemen's Beef Association is the US industry feedlots audit defining and ensuring a set of practices and criteria that must be met by feedlots in order to be compliant with BQA. Farm Check is a program by which third party auditors check on the farm for such things as simple access to food and water, as well as proper human animal interaction and worker training. And there is Progressive Beef, which is a program of internal and third party audits that entails a verified cattle quality management system to show transparency in how cattle are raised, including the areas of animal welfare, food safety and sustainability. Outside the USA, the two of the probably most prominent organizations are the OIE, which is the World Organization for Animal Health, involved in animal and human sectors, working together to protect their health and ensure food safety and security. The RSPCA, apart from its well-known responsibilities in terms of domesticated and other animals and livestock, is particularly working to ensure all farm animals receive a humane end to life. The Global Animal Partnership focuses on health and productivity, 
natural living, and emotional well-being, which are three overlapping components that contribute to good farm animal welfare. A greener world is a meaningful label around farm animal welfare as, farm as, as well as farm sustainability. And the World Animal Welfare Standards focuses on proving animal welfare during transportation and slaughter. The Leather Working Group was formed initially in 2005 as a tool for reporting on the environmental impact of tanneries. Initially, it represented a handful of global brands and a small number of leading shoe tanners looking to have third-party verification of their environmental performance and a driver in the form of benchmarks for ongoing improvement. Today, it has 750 leather manufacturers in one form or another under audit, covering leather productions of almost all species for use in garments, shoes, upholstery, and leather goods. Five or six years ago, the Leather Working Group formed a subgroup called the Animal Welfare Group. This was an independent group separately funded by brands, leading meat packers, and leather manufacturers. It set about creating country profiles to examine the risks of animal welfare in those countries. And today, those country profiles cover approximately 73% of global leather production. This means nine and a half billion square feet of annual bovine leather production, 3.75 billion square feet of ovine and caprine leather production, and around 60% of global cattle and 50% of global ovine, caprine, and porcine herds. This year, the Leather Pro Working Group uh, uh, incorporated its new Protocol 7. And one of the biggest changes in Protocol 7 is that it now incorporates traceability of outgoing traceability as well as incoming traceability as a metal rated critical section. This is a further step by the LWG to ensuring ESG or environmental social governance compliance around animal welfare. In 2019 at Prime Asia, we set about responding to the needs of Alcan's customers for deeper involvement in sustainability, traceability, and ESG compliance. Alongside our already existing sustainability targets within our plants, Prime Asia set goals and targets around upstream engagement in its supply stream. The aim was a more proactive approach to engage directly and to promote and generate a more meaningful impact at farm level. And as such, Prime Asia's targets now include aspirational goals for a growing percentage of our supply that will fall under our responsibly raised platform over the coming decade. So what are we looking at and how do we define and track compliance with our definition of responsibly raised? We encompass six major parameters. Sound animal welfare practices, a better use of all the natural resources available, the lowering of CO2 emissions, traceability through the whole of the supply chain, best-in-class labor practices from the farm through the feedlots to the slaughterhouse, and the existence, where possible, of third-party verification. In South America, we partnered with Minerva Leather around the production of a set of isolated and third-party verified meat and the hides coming from internationally certified organic programs. They include the USDA natural, National Organic Program and also the EU Organic Program. 
This organic certification at farms encompasses a strong approach to animal welfare with high farming standards, including regenerative practices, such as the cultivation and uh, of practices that maintain and improve the physical, chemical and biological condition of soil. Crop nutrients and soil fertility are managed through rotations, through cover crops and the application of plant and animal materials. There's the protection of water resources, wetlands and adjacent areas, and no use of synthetic pesticides or the use of hormones and growth proteins. Importantly with this program, every hide carries a physically embedded stamp which identifies the farm of birth along with the slaughterhouse and tannery, meaning that every hide has full life traceability. Here in the USA, our initial partnership is with Tyson Fresh Foods around their open prairie natural meats program. This is leathers traceable to the farm of birth, 100% vegetarian diet with no antibiotics, no added hormones, and no growth promotants. Strict verified animal well-being standards that are required by all the partners including the ranches, the feedlots, their employees, transportation. And the cattle is raised on pasture for most of its life with increased emphasis on land stewardship. During 2021, we will be adding other programs to this platform, not just in the USA and South America, but in Australia and eventually in Europe. We believe that our responsibly raised platform provides defined added value for our customers by creating a responsible supply chain from farming through our supply base and our own production plants, which will result in footwear which can be marketed by brands that will meet the demands and needs of a far more informed and discerning consumer base. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Hello, everyone. We're pleased to be with you again for another roundtable debate for the 2021 APLF Academy. I'm Stephen Tierney, editor of World Leather, and it's my privilege to help bring you this discussion on connections between the livestock and meat, se meat sectors and our beloved leather value chain. We're going to focus on two specific points, the supply of hides and skins and the importance to leather manufacturers and to leather consumers of the way animals are treated on farms and feedlots. Our conversation today is with three tremendous guests, each of them active, valuable and highly esteemed contributors to the global discussion about leather. We have Ian Sher an expert on height supply and vice president of procurement at Tanning Group, Prime Asia. Also taking part today is Dr. Kerry Senior, the director of industry body UK Leather and in his spare time, secretary to the International Council of Tanners. And we have Stephen Sothman, president of the Leather and Height Council of America. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. Just to give a tiny bit of context, then, uh, there is a reason why we are talking about hides and about animal welfare. In 2014, World Leather launched a series of free to view and free to share essays to explain as many aspects of the leather industry to the wider world as we could. And we used the title Nothing to Hide. There are 15 essays in the series, some contributed by senior industry figures and some compiled by the World Leather team. A lot has changed since 2014, as we all know. And at the start of 2021, we began updating the series. And the first two essays for which we have published new versions examine heights, that's essay number one, and animal welfare in essay number two. Two. So everyone can read those and all the other essays in the series at 
nothing to hide.org. Nothing to hide is um, nothing hyphen to hyphen hide.org. To coincide then with these new essays coming out, we are going to talk to Ian and Kerry and Stephen about exactly this subject matter now. So first, hides. And very briefly, I want to start by sharing with the wider audience some figures from the United Nations Food and Agriculture or Organization, the FAO. We know there are others. Uh, the figures themselves probably aren't the most important thing, but the FAO is the source of these ones that we've used in the essay. In 2019, the total number of cattle and buffalo hides that meat companies and livestock farmers produced worldwide, according to the FAO, was 352.1 million, 352.1 million. And this was a 9% increase on the figure for 2018. Goat skins add another 500 million pieces per year and sheep skins a further 600 million. So the total is close to 1.5 billion pieces of material. Ian Sher, if I may start with you, you've been observing these figures for many years. I want to ask, to what extent do the numbers for 2019, these ones and other ones that you've seen, to what extent did they fit into a longer term pattern? They seem high, so why are they still so high? And why is the total growing? And do you expect that to continue? Stephen, uh, I'm not going to get into any sort of debate on the accuracy of the numbers, but I agree with you in terms of the trend. Certainly, as we move forward, uh, the need for protein to fill the world grows every year, as does the economic ability of people to, to buy it. Um, particularly in developing countries. We've seen that in China. We've seen the growth of meat as a staple in China, in other parts of the world, constantly increasing. Mm. We, also see, we also see dramatic improvements in farming around the world in terms of the ability to produce uh, bovine meats, in a shorter period of time to finish them better, to finish them ready for harvesting in a faster period of time than what we were used to many, many years ago. And added to that, in terms of animal welfare, in terms of animal husbandry, dramatic reductions in calf mortality rates mm -hmm. contributes to herd rebuilding and therefore the supply of market-ready cattle as a form of protein for consumers. So I think that uh, we will continue to see, I don't know if the trends will be as great as they have been in recent years, but it will certainly be a growing trend, not a reducing trend, which emphasizes the need for us as an industry to be able to upcycle mm -hmm. the hides that come from that harvest as as a as a byproduct of that meat production. Okay, okay. The hides therefore will continue to be available, and I suppose there's little point in asking anyone in this discussion about the best thing humanity can do with all the hides and skins. Uh, we we'll all we we're, we're all going to agree that the best thing is to make leather out of them. But Kerry Senior, can you sum up please why you think it is that we still hear loud and influential voices trying to talk brands and consumers out of using leather, trying to persuade them not to use it, trying to convince them to choose substitute materials instead. Yeah, I think there's uh, a number of considerations here, a number of influences being applied. Um, Firstly, we have a sort of radical end of thinking, if you like, where the animal rights groups and other environmental NGOs who either find the use of any animal product unacceptable mm. or are concerned about the impact um, 
whether real or imagined, of livestock on different parts of the environment. Um, and they are extremely vocal. They make some extremely wild claims, but they have a very high profile. Um, mm -hmm. And their message is, uh, their attack on leather is more about trying to prevent the use of the animal in the first place than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have some very high profile support. Uh, for example, uh, Lewis Hamilton has been in the press again, being vocal about his veganism and his, um, his position on that. Uh, we're not going to change those people. Um, and they will always be opposed, I think, to leather just by virtue of his association with the meat industry. Mm. We then have a group which is the, <clears throat> you might consult, call the consume, con concerned consumers. Uh, and these are people who are genuinely well-intentioned, who have a concern about the way the planet is going uh, and hear these other voices, these more radical voices, um, and not ours. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, because they want to be seen to be doing the right thing, they're perhaps um, question about using products like leather. Mm. Finally, though, I think um, we have a rather more cynical group, and I think this is the group that is simply looking for an angle and looking for something to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and this would include fashion journalists, for instance, where in order to generate uh, copy, you uh, have to have something new and interesting to talk about. And whether it's you know new pineapple leather, mushroom leather, whatever you like, it gives you something to talk about, and inevitably that will be juxtaposed against the real deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, because you're trying to talk up one, you will talk down the other. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, this is usually, you know, these puff pieces usually feature in the same edition as telling you which leather boots you should pair with your outfit, which is, you know, deeply yeah. ironic. And we also have those who are looking for a marketing angle. Um, so if we think about, for instance, uh, the issue with Mini recently announcing that they would no longer put leather upholstery in their cars. Mm. And the reason for this is they want to use more sustainable materials, apparently. Yeah. What you have to remember is that Mini is owned by BMW. Oh, yeah. uh, and just today, we've seen an announcement that Bada are opening a new tannery in South Africa, right in the heart of the automotive sector, so they can be closer to BMW. BMW. OK, what we're looking at here is a message that is aimed to fit a particular consumer group rather than a genuine agenda. Um, and that might sound like a harsh judgment, but I can't see any other reason why you would simply opt to uh, remove leather from one line, but not others. Yeah. So there is a number of obviously there's a number of pressures there. The, the failing, I think, on the industry side is one we all understand is that we've not been very good at putting our side of the argument. Uh, and I think we're getting better. And what we need is to ensure that we have a message which gets out to the consumer that leather is a renewable sustainable material that all things being even they can use with a clear conscience. Good. Thanks very much. Uh, Steve Sothman, the Hades, if Mini is successful in and Lewis Hamilton is successful in convincing people not to use them because exactly of the dynamics that Ian Sher was talking about, those Hades will continue to accumulate. Uh, the Leather and Hyde Council of America has carried out in-depth analysis of some of the figures that make up that dynamic, particularly with regard to Hyde's going to waste, because if nobody wants them, if nobody uses them, they're going to go to landfill or they're going to be incinerated. Can you remind our audience today of exactly how you went about that work, what you found when you looked at the figures and also say what the environmental consequences are of hides going to waste instead of going into tanneries. Yeah, happy to do that, Stephen. Thanks for, for the question. And and I think I I moved through my presentation very quickly on this part. So I think it's a good it's a good topic to stop and really kind of uh, dig into. So we took the numbers well we started with u.s numbers and a couple of years ago we know that a certain amount of u.s hides did not make it into the the leather supply chain and as you noted at the beginning of your presentation even in a, in a country like the u.s which has very good statistics generally for a lot of different products are we have to kind of triangulate 
hide production, how, how we're utilizing those hides, those types of things. So we, we, we were a pretty, with a pretty good sense of confidence, we were able to figure out how many hides didn't make it into, into production. Uh, so then we, we went from there and we said, okay, well, what, what's the global impact? Uh, what, would, what would that look like on a global scale? And as you noted, statistics aren't great in that sphere, but we took what was available. We started with the FAO numbers. Uh, at that point, it was about 337 million hides globally that they were saying are produced. Um, and we said, okay, well, what do we know ends up in leather? What, you know, what, what can we for sure tell that ends up in the leather supply chain? So we looked at trade statistics. We looked at production statistics from various countries that we know produce a lot of leather. And we were able to, again, triangulate what we think ended up in, in leather. And then that meant that a certain amount and ended up in a landfill somewhere. Um, yeah. And we know that, that what that number is, is, is open to debate because it are, again, our statistics aren't great in this area, but if, if you take the FAO numbers as true, we're talking about 150 million hides a year that are ending up in a landfill somewhere. And these aren't coming from the major beef producing countries. It's not U S Europe, Australia, Brazil. It, it's, it's mainly coming from the poorest parts of the world. It's your backyard farmers. It's, uh, you know, rural Africa, rural Asia, those types of areas. Uh, and then we said, okay, well, if those hides are just ending up in a landfill or on the ground somewhere, obviously, as they break down, as they decompose, they are going to have an impact as well, uh, mm -hmm. releasing the carbon that was stored in those hides to begin with. What, mm -hmm. is, that, what is that impact? Uh, so we went to our U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and they have public statistics and, and public uh, ratios they use to talk about things like food waste, you know, mm -hmm. what, what, how much carbon is released when, when, when we discard food. We took those numbers, we applied into that 150 million, and we started coming up with general ranges of what would be the CO2 that's released. We came up with about 3.3 million uh, tons of CO2 equivalent, obviously back of the envelope uh, uh, math, but it's a lot is, is what yeah, the conclusion we the came point. to. Yeah. It's a point is it's a lot. <laughs> And, and so, yeah, so we, we and, and, that, and, and the whole idea behind this is our, is our zero waste initiative. It's, it's look, we, these animals have already sequestered this carbon for us in the form of their hide. Let's yes. keep it sequestered in the hide, use it for leather production purposes. That leather, whatever that leather ends up being used for, whether it's footwear or bag or auto or whatever, will be used for decades, potentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it'll keep that carbon sequestered in that leather as opposed to decomposing after a couple of weeks and going right back up into the atmosphere. So we, we believe this is an opportunity for carbon sequestration. Uh, and there's a lot of challenges ahead, but it, it, it's certainly uh, an opportunity for our industry and for the world uh, as a whole. Marvelous. Thanks very much. In other words, if you want to uh, make sure that those heights have a minimal environmental impact, you turn them into leather, you don't waste them. The, we move on to the second theme of the discussion, which is linked, it's animal welfare. And I'd like to start by asking Steve and Kerry together what the significance of animal welfare is for the leather industry. Uh, because tanners don't look after animals, uh, they take the hide and they turn it into leather. Um, farmers and meat companies are responsible for looking after the animals. But recent declarations from companies, Kerry mentioned many, but another major automotive company, Volvo, said recently that it will use no leather in the interiors of a new range of electric vehicles. But Volvo specifically gave animal welfare as the reason. And this suggests, to me anyway, that there has been a change in attitude. And I wonder what has changed exactly. Why does this question of animal welfare seem to matter more than it used to? Now you go first, please, Steve. Yeah, good question. And 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 frankly, Carrie kind of touched on it a little bit already. We 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 have the what's called the concerned consumer. Right. We, we have the consumer and, and that that group of consumers is growing. And I think very quickly they want to make sure that whatever they are buying and they're consuming has been produced in a way that is not going to have negative impacts on the environment, on animals, on people, you know, in terms of the labor in their supply chain. I mean, they, they want to they want to be sure that that is taking place. Now, the problem is 
where the sources of information, where they are receiving information about their supply chains isn't very good, frankly. Mm-hmm. And so they are, they are, those consumers are subject to a lot of misinformation. And brands, I would put a lot of brands, especially those that are not fundamentally involved in the agricultural side of the industry, who do not understand how a lot of these things are, are raised, uh, they are also subject to a lot of misinformation campaigns by groups who have ulterior motives, especially against animal agriculture. So it's very easy for um, a company like Volvo or uh, you can name a footwear company or a bag company or whoever who gets um, cornered by a, uh, an animal rights group or something like that and, and, set, and, and, and is told all these horror stories about how animals are treated, which are not true most of the time. Uh, their easiest out is just to say, okay, we're not going to use it. Done. We're, we're washing our hands of this, and we've got all these al- alternatives. A lot of those alternatives have a different environmental story completely, That's, but it's, they're yeah. not really being called out for it by this, at this point. So they can use those alternatives, especially plastic-based ones, without really any sort of PR repercussions. So for them, it's simple math. And, uh, and, and for, that, for that, I understand uh, but that's also, as Kerry was saying, where we need to be doing a better job of getting to those those consumers, getting to those brands before some of our detractors can get there and give them the, the full information and the, the full picture. Okay, thanks. And in your your view, Kerry, what's your perception of what's happening here? Why are companies like Volvo, previously very enthusiastic users of leather, including leather from the United Kingdom? making a negative association now between leather and animal welfare what's what's going on well it's the volvo case is an interesting one because they're doing it with a particular model which is an electric vehicle um Mm. volvo customers generally probably fit very well into that consumer concern uh, concern consumer section Mm -hmm. Um, and so again i think there's an element here of just product placement what is the what is the likely buyer of this electric vehicle want um, yeah. because they are still using leather in their other models. Uh, and ironically, buying their leather from some of the best tanneries in the world, with some of the most transparent supply chains in the world, with some of the best environmental practice in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, and Steve, I, the case of a company like Volvo, um, I think they do know what's going on in their supply chain. I think a company like Volvo is very careful about its supply chain, uh, and they understand what's happening within it. So there's an element here of just uh, playing to the audience in yeah. for the people, I think, which, which is marketing. That's what happens. We can't argue with that. If you look at wider, though, Steve's absolutely right. There's, there is, um, you know, there is pressure on these companies to appear to be doing the right thing. Yeah. And if the story about leather is negative, then you ride that wave and say, fine, we won't use it anymore. There is also an element Steve didn't mention. Um, which I think is quite a strong player, and this is cost. Um, one thing, if you can justify substituting your leather upholstery with synthetics, you have the added bonus that you'll save money. Yeah. And we've been seeing this decontenting going on for many years. Um, and some companies, uh, Toyota in Australia, for instance, have been pulled over the coals and taken to court for it by replacing leather with synthetics, but not telling the consumer. Mm-hmm. This is happening with other brands in other parts of the world where non-leather materials are being sold as leather upholstery. Mm-hmm. So they want the cachet, they want the appeal, yeah. they don't want the material. Or the cost. Or the cost, indeed. Okay, thanks. Um, finally, Ian, there's um, something here that even the most enthusiastic reader of Nothing to Hide essay number two may not have noticed. When we published the first version, in 2014, there was nothing in the content about leather manufacturing groups contributing to this wider debate uh, with their own animal welfare programs. But the new version, the 2021 version of the essay, has details of three programs from leather manufacturing groups. We have Kind Leather from JBS Coros, Greener Pastures from Isotantic, and responsibly raised from your group from Prime Asia. So Ian, what is responsibly raised? Why did Prime Asia decide to invest in it? And what difference do you think 
it is making or will make in the future. Stephen, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I would tell you that uh, we, uh, working with the footwear brands that we work with, are very conscious of the drive that has taken place, particularly in the last two to three years, in terms of sustainability, in terms of their ability to reach out to particularly millennial consumers who really are a very informed, very active group in terms of consumption, particularly mm -hmm. with the brands that we work with. In 2019, we looked at responsibly raised uh, for the first time within our procurement. Now, we believe as a company in uh, that responsible footwear involves responsible manufacturing from our part. We have had uh, very strong sustainable uh, sustainability goals that we set for ourselves each year and renew each year on a five-year basis in terms of how we produce our leathers, uh, our LWG ratings, traceabilities, ZDHC compliance. But we realized in 2019 that we need to move that upstream through our supply base. As now, far as the farm, as far as the... Exactly, yeah. exactly. Because firstly, we believe in engagement. Uh, without engagement, you can't change anything. Uh, engagement for us is a very important part of our supply base. Um, and we work very closely with our suppliers as partners, not just as, as, as spot suppliers. Mm. So we formulated our responsibly raised program in which we set certain criteria as a view to promoting change upstream with our supply base. Um, we looked at uh, uh, items such as animal welfare standards because we recognize that animal welfare is a very fundamental issue for so many people around the world. We looked at CO2 emissions, uh, labor practices, the use of natural resources, uh, third party verification. And the biggest challenge of all for us, particularly here in the United States, traceability back to the birth farm. Yeah. Because traceability is a very important issue for consumers today. They want to know where it came from, how it was handled, was it handled well? Uh, were the five freedoms of animals uh, respected, etc.? Yeah. Um, so we invented this, not invented. We designed a program about around responsibly raised. We set out to find suppliers that we could incorporate into this program, and more importantly. We set for ourselves aspirational goals between now and 2030 in terms of how every year we would grow the percentage of our supply base around our responsibly raised programs. In other words, each year more and more of the hides that prime major processes will be from sources that are in keeping with these criteria that you've laid down. This is the targets we've set for ourselves. Yeah. Now, I say again, it's not an easy target to achieve, yeah. given the percentage of American raw material that we use in our productions. And I don't want to point the finger at Stephen, but what we really need to do here in the United States is really encourage traceability beyond a slaughterhouse and beyond a feedlot back to the birth farm. We have it in Australia. We can get it now in Brazil, and we are seeing an increasing proportion of Brazil and other Latin American companies provide it. Uh, we have it in Europe with passports for animals, etc. But this is the one area that we are targeting, and we, we are working with our supply base here to encourage and promote. And we recognize that it has a cost, and we recognize that we have to cover that cost and justify that cost, given that what we're talking about here is a byproduct that probably in the overall scheme of things doesn't, re doesn't uh, uh, become more than 2% of the total retail value of the animal at well, the end of the process. 
Yeah. So that that for us is a challenge. That for us is a challenge. But it's a challenge that we take on board, that uh, we are happy to take on board, and that we believe is vital in terms of what the consumers are looking for yeah. in the long term in terms of leather as a byproduct. And I would also add that I agree with Kerry. I think as an industry in recent, in past years, we've done a terrible job of promoting ourselves and we need to really mm. our game in that respect. In that regard, we've been very proactive as a company in terms of leathers naturally and the campaigns that they have run, et cetera. Um, and we internally as a company are very active in our own regard in doing that, we've just completed a 12-month life cycle analysis from from farm to factory gate, um, covering three countries, two production countries, and a variety of products. Probably mm. one of the most extensive that's ever been done in our industry. So, Ian, what um, is 2019 when you started to work on Responsibly Raised? And I think you formally launched it in 2020, so it's early days. But can you say very briefly what immediate uh, response you've had from those big footwear companies that Primeja um, is a, is, has as its customers? Stephen, uh, as you would understand, in our sector of the industry, particularly with fashion footwear, there is a cycle in terms of adoption by by which by time you design a leather, uh, promote it, it goes through marketing, it goes through cost accounting, it goes through production. It takes time. Uh, well, it takes time. Yeah. So it's anything from a, a, an 18th to 24 month in terms of seasons. Uh, we are starting to see the adoptions now for spring summer 22, um, which will come into effect in the later part of this year. Yeah. And we're building our inventories towards that. Um, and we just hope to see more adoptions as we move forward in terms of being able to promote responsibly raised as another part of a very responsible supply chain from farm to a consumer product. Super. Okay. Um, well, Steve, do you want to respond? Yeah, just really quickly, just because uh, since Ian had a, <laughs> a note directly to me, no, I, I, I would say just two points I wanted to make. One, on the traceability aspect in the U.S., um, I think we I think we're turning a tide on that one because in the meetings I'm in with with the producer side of the of the industry, there used to be a debate of whether or not we needed traceability at all, mm -hmm. and that debate has pretty much been settled. I think on the producer side, they they understand we need the we need the traceability. Now it's more of a how are we going to do it? Who's going to pay for it? How do you implement it? The U.S. is a big country. The U.S. cattle industry is a really big industry. So they're 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 working through these things right now. But I think we've we've turned that tide in terms of uh, whether we can even do it to begin with. Um, that and also a, a good point that Ian raised. That I I, I want to highlight. There is a lot of information about how these animals are raised that is lost when the hide comes off the animal. Um, you know, in the U.S., for example, 85 percent of our cattle are produced under the Beef Quality Assurance Program, which is one of the major animal welfare on farm programs. Eighty five percent of that, the vast majority of that information is lost as soon as the hide is removed. So I think what Prime Asia is doing and some of the others in working up their supply chain to get that information and pull it forward is fantastic. And I really hope that others in the industry will, will start looking into that as well. OK, super. Um... Kerry, was there anything you wanted to add? Kerry? No, just on the traceability issue, it is a, it is a problem, but it is solvable. Uh, it's getting the will. I mean, here in Europe, you could trace the animal straight back to where it came from, from the farm, the material, the information travels with the meat. But as Steve said, as soon as the hide is taken from the animal, that requirement disappears because it's a legal requirement for the food. It's not for the hide. Um, but we need to work out a way of keeping that information traveling through the system with the hide as it goes on, because it's it's what people want uh, and it's what should be done. Well, thanks very much to all of you for another exceptionally interesting discussion in the 2021 APLF Academy series. It's been enlightening. It's been inspiring to hear the three of you talk these questions through. And I'm deeply grateful to all of you, to Kerry Senior, to Steve Sothman, to Ian Sher for your excellent contributions. I hope we have the chance to talk again soon.
thanks once again and goodbye. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks very much. Mm -hmm.